and welcome to Eyes on Eye Care 2022 to the implementation track. There are so many great events going on today, so make sure you check out that exhibit hall and you can check out that in, in, into the um, innovation zone as well. Also, if you are planning on taking CE, you only have to take the pretest once before you take your first CE course, and then you will be prepared for the rest of the conference until the after where you'll have a post CE test. And at that point in time, it'll be after that last session. I am so excited to be here today with Dr. Mania Madan. I am very excited to hear more about her sharing about platelet-rich plasma and its implications with dry eye. I learned a ton about this in school, but I'm so excited to learn more because it's truly a revolutionary practice that we can take. So go ahead and take it away. really high, but I really don't want you to worry about them, okay? I've seen several eye doctors and every time I see them, everybody just seems to be hung up on my eye pressures and nobody really seems to be talking about my dry eye, which is what's really bothering me. And you know, when she said this, it really kind of took me back a little bit. I mean, glaucoma is a disease where we know we can lose vision from, but here's this patient telling me, don't worry about that. I'm okay with that. But what you really need to worry about is this constant stinging, burning irritation that I feel on my eye. And so this was, uh, you know, this was kind of a bit of an eye opening uh, for me. And, and this was a case, uh, you know, that I love sharing with you guys. So here she is. Uh, this is her current, current treatment plan. So she's on Hilo drops, which are hyaluronic. Perhaps different formulations are available in different parts of the world. Uh, she's on Zydra, Omega, and she wears these moisture goggles everywhere all the time. And she's literally got to take these moisture goggles on off to be able to put her drops in. And then you can also see here are the glaucoma drops that she's, uh, she's also using. And she's had SLT in both of her eyes. She's had cataract surgery and she also has lupus. But besides, beyond, you know, with all of this going on, you know, her pressures are still high. They're about 28, if you remember from the last slide. And between all of this, she's putting her drops in 16 times a day and not feeling a difference and feeling worse. And so this, you know, we could really understand that this could be very emotionally exhausting for this patient. Wanted to just share her OCT scans with you. Um, as you can see from her OCT scans, there is some nerve fiber loss spinning in the right eye. The left eye looks pretty normal. And then this is her visual field testing. And I think we can both agree looking at these visual fields that uh, 
she hasn't lost any vision from glaucoma, right? It looks pretty normal. There's maybe a slight arcuate starting in that right eye there. But overall, this is, this is a pretty clean visual field. So when she says, hey, my glaucoma is really not affecting my life, it really isn't, okay? So she hasn't lost any vision from her glaucoma, but in fact, now treating her with all of those glaucoma drops, we've you know almost started to create a problem that is now affecting the quality of her life. So here's where her ocular surface looks like. As you can see, you know, there's this definitely definite signs of dry eye disease on her, um, on her corneal surface. You can see uh, the staining, the, um, the corneal um, staining there, sorry. And then there's also that quick tear break of time. There's goblet cell loss. And if I were to kind of zoom into her lids, you would not be surprised to see, you know, my bomine gland dysfunction. You would not be uh, surprised to see all the stuff that we see with prostaglandin use. So her OSDI score is through the roof, right? She's 39 in there and, and she's constantly um, just feeling the irritation and the impact of this on her life. Um, and now there have been a lot of studies that have published and that have shown us that glaucoma drops um, do cause dry eye disease. In fact, majority of the patients, you know, on glaucoma drops have dry eye. And we know that the more drops we use, the more dry eye disease that they have. And this patient, it, you know, is on three different glaucoma drops at this point. And we also know that the BAK in these drugs and the active ingredients can cause uh, conjunctival and corneal cell damage. So here are a plethora of studies that are showing, you know, exactly what we see clinically in our patients, right? So there's punctate keratitis, there's damage to the conjunctiva, there's neurotropic changes, there's conjunctival inflammation. In fact, biopsy done from uh, patients that have been on glaucoma drops for several years. So conjunctival biopsies done from patients that have been on glaucoma drops for several, several years, you know, show histological changes, show more inflammation, you know, in the conjunctiva of those patients than versus patients that have not been on these uh, glaucoma drops. And in fact, those patients, you know, that have been on glaucoma drops and have these conjunctival changes, go on to do poorer with ocular surgeries later on in life, whether it be, you know, a glaucoma surgery that they need or another surgery because that conjunctiva has been so inflamed for so long. You and I also see blepharitis. We see meibomian gland dysfunction with these patients. And of course, you know, this is way more beyond than um, just telling our patients that, hey, this drop might cause a little bit of lash growth or it might cause a little bit of burning and stinging. I mean, these are real changes that we're going to see, you know, beyond just some lash growth and that, uh, you know, perhaps we, we educate our patients about. Uh, so once kind of viewed as this painful nuisance, dry eye disease today is considered a significant public health issue. And this was actually published in Ophthalmology Times earlier this year. And I think you and I uh, both can agree uh, at this point, you know, listening to some of the talks during this weekend, and then also from what we have uh, seen with our patients. This was a really interesting study that I wanted to also share. This was a study that looked at utility scores to kind of grade how chronic diseases affect a patient's quality of life. So they compared the utility score of patients with moderate to severe dry eye disease and found that the utility score of those patients was similar to the utility score of patients being on hospital dialysis for kidney failure and or having angina. So you guys, this was a really a big eye opening for me as well. Like how can dry eye disease impact you so much that it's similar to being on kidney dialysis, but this is what our patients are telling us. So we know that there is psychological burden with this disease and not only for the patient, this was an, an, another interesting study that looked at this, but also for the people that are involved with this patient, right? Whether it be their spouse or their children or whoever is kind of taking care of this patient, they also feel uh, you know, this self-perceived uh, psychological burden from, uh, from the person that they're taking care of. So there's, there's a wide uh, kind of a link with this. So let's change our gears a little bit. You guys, we've all heard this, uh, you know, this explanation of dry eye, right? This is uh, right from uh, TFOS DUES2, multifactorial disease of the ocular surface, characterized by loss of homeostasis of the tear film. And I'm actually going to put a little bit more emphasis on the tear film. So this definition does not say loss of homeostasis of the cornea. 
No. It does not say loss of homeostasis of the conjunctiva. No. It says loss of homeostasis of the tear film that is now causing dry eye disease and ocular surface changes and impacting the patient's quality of life, right? So it must be something really special in this tear film that it's the loss of it, the loss of homeostasis of this tear film that's causing all of these problems. And also I wanted to, you know, kind of share here, I looked at definitions of dry eye disease kind of across the globe. There's this Asian, you know, ophthalmology group, there's European ophthalmology group, and they all have a little bit of a different definition of dry eye disease. But when you really kind of start comparing and looking at it, the one huge similarity I noticed in all of those uh, definitions was Again, alluding to this tear film, it was, you know, the reduction of tear film or the uh, quick tear breakup time or loss of tear volume. So all of those definitions, no matter where we are talking about in the world, I think we can all agree that it's something about this tear film and the loss of some component of it that is causing uh, this dry eye disease. So our, um, and this is the treatment algorithm that's been put forth by, um, by DUES2. And so I've just kind of organized it in a way that we can kind of see it and see where autologous serum and PRP, because that's what we're talking about, blood biologics are uh, put into this system and how it can manage this dry eye disease, uh, you know, vicious circle. So we've got our conservative stuff in the front and then we've got some in-office treatments and, um, and our medications. And then, you know, we kind of move on to uh, PRP and autologous and amniotic membranes. But let me see if I can change your thinking a little bit here. So here we are. So how do we all get started in, in this blood biologics? Well, it dates way, way, way back to before Christ. And if any one of you can read Egyptian, it's listed right there. This is, uh, you know, this references blood use in the eye. Uh, but, uh, you know, many years later in 1975 was actually the first use that we saw of blood uh, biologics in the eye by uh, Ralph and his colleagues. And they actually, in this study, told their patients to cut their finger and squeeze a little bit of blood in their eye as treatment for dry eye disease. Now we've come a little bit further than that. Uh, in 1984, we uh, started to see the rise of autologous serum for, for the treatment of dry eye disease. And now today we see tons of applications of PRP, right? I think in other forms of medicine, this is a picture that's courtesy of my husband. Um, this is a dental implant with platelet-rich fibrin in, um, you know, use around it. So, uh, so that's PRP application. We've heard of it in dermatology with with those vampire facials uh, using again PRP to rejuvenate the skin. We've seen it in hair growth and we've also seen it in orthopedics and of course in ophthalmology and in eye care as well, right? And now this whole uh, blood biologics can get a little bit confusing. I mean, there are so many names of it. There's autologous serum, there's PRP, there's platelet-rich growth factor, platelet-rich fibrin, lysate platelet-rich fibrin, and it kind of just goes on. And I think what's really important to know um, is that these are all blood biologics. So they're all derived from, um, you know, from our blood after getting rid of um, RBCs. So basically we draw the blood, we centrifuge it, and when we centrifuge it, we get rid of the, um, the uh, red blood cells and then use the stuff that's kind of left over. And then depending on how much we centrifuge for how long or how many times, we're gonna get all of those different products. And really what the difference in all of those is, is the amounts of growth factors. So some of them will carry a lot more growth factors. Some of them will carry less growth factors. Some of them would be more liquid form. Some of them more would be a more kind of a solid form, but they're all kind of, you know, after the same thing, it's, it's the growth factors in them. So in eye care, of course, we're using PRP and autologous. And so I'll change uh, gears into that. So in every, uh, you know, in almost every dry eye, we know that we need a lubricating drop, right? And we do have several lubricating drops on the market. Um, but again, none of them really come close to matching the chemistry of our own natural tears, right? Because otherwise we would have cured dry eye by now. Uh, of course, we can match the pH. We want them to be similar in osmolarity to our own ocular surface. Uh, but there are just so many components of, uh, of our tear film that, uh, you know, that our own magic drops carry that we really cannot match with a lot of these lubricating drops. And so I wanted to talk about, you know, really what is so special about our magic drops and why are we not able to match it, you know, in, in, uh, um, 
uh, with an over-the-counter lubricating drop. So our uh, own human tears carry about 1,400 known molecules. That is just fascinating, right? And together, these molecules form the most perfect lubricant that are constantly hydrating our, our corneal surface or conjunctival surface. They have antimicrobial activity. So they have immunoglobulins that are constantly protecting our eye from uh, you know, the stressors that we put on our eye. They have anti-inflammatory activities. And again, preventing inflammation to build up from perhaps it's contact lens use or it's you know flying in an airplane, which we all haven't done in a long time, but uh, our tear film helps us there as well. And it's constantly nourishing. And they also help to maintain the clarity of the cornea, right? Preventing those blood vessels to kind of invade the cornea. And I think one of the most amazing um, factors of our own tear film is that this uh, really fancy world, word, epitheliotropic. So our tear film is actually epitheliotropic. And what that word really means is that it can support proliferation, migration, differentiation of corneal and conjunctival cells. And that's really what's fascinating and what um, you know, over-the-counter lubricating drops and medications cannot match um, to be able to support uh, the corneal and conjunctival cells on our ocular surface. So what is PRP? Well, in the most simplest terms, PRP is platelets plus plasma. So platelet rich plasma, right? And now how do we get to PRP? Well, uh, you may remember from your biology class, our blood carries many blood cells. There are, you know, half of our blood is pretty much uh, red blood cells, which is 41%. And then there is a small percentage of those white blood cells, which is about 5% of our blood is white blood cells, lymphocytes and monocytes. There's a very small percentage of our blood cells is also platelets, so less than 1%. And then all of those cells are suspended in this yellow uh, liquid called the plasma. So when we talk about making PRP, what we're really wanting to do is get rid of all of those other cells in our blood, centrifuge, get rid of all of those other cells in the blood and just use the platelets and suspend it in, in our own plasma in the yellow liquid. And that's what platelet rich plasma is. So PRP can contain, uh, you know, up to three to five times the concentration of platelets that's found in our own blood. So why platelets, right? What is so special about, uh, about platelets? Well, they contain over 800 molecules that are released at the site of tissue injury to help with not only clot formation, but to repair tissue damage. They, you know, kind of start this cascade of healing to uh, make sure that the, that tissue heals well. They have anti-analgesic properties to, you know, kind of... Uh, reduce pain at the site of injury, and they also have antimicrobial properties to help reduce any bacterial infections that can happen at the site of injury. So platelets really are considered the true powerhouses of healing, and that's why we're after them, um, is because we want to kind of have all of those benefits when there is tissue damage, when there is inflammation. Plasma, you guys, is also very impressive. You know, it uh, it doesn't get enough spotlight either, but it makes up 55% of our blood. And its main function is to take nutrients and proteins to the part of the body that need it. I mean, I often compare plasma to um, Gatorade, right? It has electrolytes that help maintain uh, cell function. Of course, it's a lot better than Gatorade. Uh, it contains over eight 600 active molecules uh, that, again, are part of that process to help the body heal, help the body, you know, feel hydrated and have electrolytes and immunoglobulins to fight infections. And so really, really important, uh, you know, part of our own circulatory system that's there. Um, so now together, once we put platelets and plasma together, I mean, we get this amazing composition that has so many you know, healing of roles uh, for our body that is just fascinating. So platelets release growth factors and these growth factors are, you know, what we're really after because they play a really key role in tissue repair. They are epitheliotropic. So there's that fancy word again. They support proliferation, migration, and differentiation of corneal and conjunctival cells on our ocular surface. 
Growth factors also have many anti-inflammatory actions. Um, PRP contains vitamins from both platelets and from plasma, which help with maturation of epithelium. They contain fibronectin, they contain cytokines and lysozymes. I mean, look at these, all these amazing, uh, you know, natural things that are within our own body there to heal and help, um, you know, help the tissue uh, be regenerated. So just wanted to kind of uh, highlight the growth factors again a little bit. So here, uh, here, here are the platelets. And now platelets carry many, many growth factors. And these are the ones that we know of uh, that are helping our ocular surface. So one of them is platelet uh, derived growth factor. And as you can see, it helps with cell regeneration, cell growth, collagen production. There's vascular endothelial growth factor that also helps with promotion of wound healing. There's epithelial growth factor that's helping the corneal epithelium. There's also TGF beta growth factor. Now, this one's a bit of a tricky growth factor that's gotten a little bit of heat in, in the literature, um, uh, you know, in the, in the recent years. Now, in you know, in, in a biologically available um, concentration, this is a very helpful growth factor. But some studies have indicated that if we have too high of this growth factor, it can actually hinder healing. So a little bit of interesting stuff there. But uh, again, many growth factors within our platelets that are there to kind of heal the ocular surface. So back to our tear film, our magic tears, and I wanted to go ahead and compare the composition of PRP uh, with our own natural tears. And you're gonna notice so many amazing similarities, right? Again, it's the loss of homeostasis of that tear film, um, you know, that's causing all these problems. So can we, by now matching this, help, right? So that's, that's kind of the question. So as you can see, tears in PRP have similar pH and osmolarity. Check, check. That's wonderful. There are lots of uh, immunoglobulins in our tears on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you can see we also have that in PRP. There's growth factors in both tears and, and PRP. I mean, who knew? That's wonderful. And we know that growth factors are important in the healing cascade. And then there's also, uh, you know, all of these electrolytes that are there uh, that are coming from our plasma and that are also also found in our natural tears to help support, you know, the, the nutrition aspect of our tear film. Uh, so the benefits of PRP, well, um, you know, uh, definitely helps with tissue repair due to those growth factors. PRP is anti-inflammatory due to those cytokines. There's immunoglobulins in there to help prevent infections. It helps to dilute the, um, you know, the pro-inflammatory mediators and so helps to reduce osmolarity. And we can see those changes uh, in, on the ocular surface. It is a natural analgesic due to some of the factors that are within the platelets to kind of help reduce pain on the ocular surface. It resembles our biological tears with uh, pH and osmolarity, and so it doesn't sting, it doesn't burn, and PRP is also completely natural. We don't, uh, there aren't any added preservatives or stabilizers, you know, to uh, to this um, this drop that we use on the ocular surface. So here's a, just wanted to share a quick patient that I saw um, that has used PRP uh, and, uh, you know, for a few months, and we could really kind of appreciate the corneal healing uh, that happened in this patient. And this was really fascinating. So I wanted to kind of talk about the preparation of autologous serum, because this is, a, you know, often a, a question that I get and uh, from patients and from uh, doctors that, that want to know more about it. So autologous serum, when we make it, um, the blood is drawn from the patient, and that blood is actually allowed to clot. So autologous serum uses clotted blood, and that's kind of the main difference between the two uh, preparations. Um, and so when we draw the blood from the patient, uh, the blood usually sits, at, you know, for two to four hours so that the clotting can start to occur. And so depending on the lab, they might have it actually sit for four hours or they might even have it sit overnight. So depending on what their formula is, they're going to just allow that blood to clot over time. Now, you can also use clotting agents to, um, you know, speed up that clotting process. And so after the blood has kind of clotted in the test tube, it's then put in a centrifuge and, and, and centrifuge. And so what happens when, uh, when the clotting occurs is that platelets become active. And when the platelets become active, they actually wrap around the red blood cells 
uh, to form a clot, right? Because that's one of their main functions. And so when, so when again, that clotting uh, has started to happen and now we centrifuge this, what we're doing is that we are settling the red blood cells at the bottom of this test tube, but we're also now settling the platelets at the bottom of the test tube as well, because now these platelets are all entangled within those red blood cells to form that or to start that clotting process. Now, when the platelets do start to clot or are activated, they do release their growth factors and which are, uh, you know, again, found in the serum. So the serum on top contains the growth factors that are released by the platelets, but the platelets themselves are going to be at the bottom of the test tube. Uh, with the red blood cells and kind of filtered out. And so when we make autologous serum, we take that yellowish clear liquid on top and then dispense that to the patients to use, uh, you know, for their dry eye disease. So now platelet-rich plasma, on the other hand, uh, uses unclotted blood. Uh, so we don't want the blood to start clotting. In fact, we can use an anticoagulant to stop the blood from clot clotting because the minute you draw it from the patient and you let it sit even for a couple of minutes, the blood's going to start clotting. So um, it has to basically uh, be prevented from clotting. And the reason we do that is we don't actually want to activate the platelets in the test tube. We want to keep the platelets in their most intact, in their most natural form, um, so that they can then be activated on the ocular surface when we dispense it to the patient. So the platelets remain in their, in their most um, you know, most, uh, um, sorry, uh, natural form. And so when we don't clot the blood, um, the platelets will then stay on top and then the RBCs will, along with the other white blood cells and all that stuff, will settle to the bottom when we centrifuge this blood. So then you get this area of platelet rich plasma, which sits right above that RBC kind of junction, then you get your plasma up on top. Um, and so it's really just about keeping the platelets in their true form. And that's, and, and so when we now dispense this to the patient, we're, you know, putting our syringe right down to where that platelet rich plasma area is kind of right over here. And that's kind of, and, and all of the plasma, and that's what we're dispensing to the patient and discarding the RBCs at the bottom. So now another question that, uh, you know, that is often asked is what's the difference between autologous serum and PRP? Um, and, and so I do want to go into a little bit of detail with that. And I know there's a lot of information on this slide, but bear with me here. Um, so as you can see from the process of making autologous serum, the one of the biggest main differences that autologous serum does not contain platelets, right? Platelets are filtered right out of the whole making process, as we just saw. And because of this, we actually have way less concentration of growth factors and plasma factors um, in autologous serum. It's also really important to note that serum is not plasma. So serum is the liquid that remains after clotting has occurred, okay? So if you remember from the previous slides, plasma also carries a lot of healing agents. And so when we activate the platelets, when we activate clotting, a lot of those factors from the plasma are going to rush out and go to the action site, you know, where the RBCs are at that bottom there with all of those platelets tangled in. And so a lot of those factors are going to be removed from the plasma as well. So we know that serum is not plasma. Serum is the liquid that remains after clotting has occurred. And so it has a lot less plasma um, kind of healing factors as well. We also know that autologous serum can have um, inflammatory cytokines, and these are, uh, again, derived from the monocytes and leukocytes that are in our blood. And it, again, has to do with initiating that clotting process, which also activates these monocytes and leukocytes. And we also know that inflammatory cytokines can be deleterious to the patients with autoimmune diseases, and I'll share a couple of studies uh, regarding that. And another thing that really comes up with autologous serum when you read the literature is that it contains a high amounts of that growth factor that I was early, earlier talking about, the TGF beta, which can suppress wound healing. And so the science behind that is that again, that, that is a wonderful growth factor, but in too high of an amount, which which we can find in autologous serum can actually suppress wound healing. So often autologous serum is diluted with saline, right? So it is either diluted with, uh, you know, 80% water or 80% saline, so 20% serum or 50% saline and then 50% uh, serum and then reduced uh, to reduce the cytokine load and which also further dilutes these growth factors and plasma factors. 
um, for the patient, and that's how it's dispensed to, to the patients. Um, it's often not dispensed at 100%. So now PRP, on the other hand, contains platelets, and that's the huge benefit of it, is that it, it contains intact platelets that are in their own true form. And so because of that, it contains high concentrations of growth factors and those plasma factors because clotting has not started or they have not been activated. And then also um, it is presumed that, that the growth factors, you know, are now going to be released in a more relevant ratio on the ocular surface. And so when the patient uses PRP drops and uses those platelets and they are at the site of tissue injury, whether it's the ocular surface or whether in medicine, it's on the skin or in dentistry, it's at the site of, um, you know, the implant. Now these platelets will be activated um, by what's happening in that tissue and, and these growth factors will be released in a more biologically relevant ratio than just being activated and dumped in a, in a test tube all at once. Um, so we also don't get these uh, inflammatory cytokines that we get with a telogus serum, uh, again, because we haven't activated them in the test tube and activated those monocytes and leukocytes. And often PRP is not diluted. There is no reason to dilute it. So it's uh, dispensed at 100%. So patients are getting you know, the most natural um, product um, that, that they can find. And, and because of these reasons in studies, PRP is considered superior to autologous serum. It's also kind of important to note that uh, none of the other parts of medicine use autologous serum. Uh, you know, they all use PRP, whether it's dentistry or orthopedics or skin. Um, so it's, it's the wide use of PRP in other forms of medicine. Um, but in, in optometry and, and in eye care, we, we still use, uh, we still see autologous serum. Um, so this was an actually an interesting study that compared uh, autologous serum from patients with active Sjogren's versus autologous serum from patients with inactive uh, uh, Sjogren's. And then they found that the autologous serum derived from patients with active Sjogren's syndrome actually did have higher inflammatory factors within this uh, autologous serum. And then there was also a clinical observation of poor response to this um, um, autologous serum in patients with this, uh, you know, active, uh, with uh, active autoimmune disease like Sjogren's. So you may have actually found that in some of your patients, um, you know, when you use autologous serum and maybe you're not getting the difference, maybe the patient is not getting better. And, you know, and that's not to say that everything is going to work for everyone, right? So in dry eye disease, sometimes there is a bit of a trial and error. And sometimes it is a bit of that multifactorial approach that, you know, might have uh, not um, been addressed in this patient. Patient, but it's also just, you know, maybe keep in mind that, uh, you know, if there is an active autoimmune condition, that there could be higher levels of, um, you know, inflammatory cytokines or higher levels uh, of inflammatory mediators in the autologous serum of these patients. Um, so here's a study uh, by Jorge Alio, and he's actually uh, done quite a bit of work with PRP. And so this was a pretty large study that had over 300 patients, and they found that 87% of these patients did notice a subjective improvement with the use of PRP drops. Uh, there was also a reduction in corneal staining in 76% of these patients. So these are really impressive numbers. And it was also important to note that they only used one round of uh, PRP rather than you know, several rounds of PRP. And often patients will ask me, how long will I have to use this uh, to be able to see any difference? And so um, in this study, 64% of the patients used PRP only for one round, uh, and usually one round is about two to three months of, of PRP use. And some of them did, uh, in fact, notice an increase in their vision, depending on, um, you know, where that corneal staining was on the corneal surface. Uh, PRP has also been used in recurrent corneal erosions, and from this study, you can see that uh, the major recurrent corneal erosions are reduced from 23 to 7, so there was definitely some healing that uh, occurred at the, at the um, epithelial level there and or the endothelial level. And then of course the minor ones increased, uh, reduced as well. Now here was another study that, uh, you know, that was really interesting. Um, so this study actually compared dry eye disease, uh, the impact on corneal nerves using a confocal microscopy to look at the corneal nerves. So on the left, there is what a normal cornea looks like with its corneal nerves. And it compared dry eye disease, evaporative dry eye disease, and aqueous, aqueous deficient dry eye disease. Um, and this was actually really interesting um, because 
you know, and, and it saw, so what it really wanted to see was the impact of uh, loss of corneal nerves in these patients. So, well, was it evaporative disease that caused more corneal nerve loss or was it um, uh, aqueous deficient disease? And so if you guys were to guess and maybe have a guess in mind, because I'll share the answers. Uh, since we don't have a poll, uh, I'm not doing a poll on this one. Um, but so it compared this normal evaporative and aqueous deficient and kind of asked this question, hey, in which type of dry eye disease do we actually notice more, more corneal damage? And so what they found was that it was actually the aqueous deficient uh, dry eye disease that had more corneal um, uh, nerve loss. And this was thought to be due to you know, uh, the autoimmune underlying causes of, um, uh, of the aqueous deficient dry eye disease. And so this was another study that kind of looked at PRP um, at the, again, at the corneal um, confocal microscopy level and, and wanted to compare and see if there was any change over time with PRP use um, on these um, corneal nerves. And they did find that, you know, this was pre-PRP, so dry eye disease, and then within uh, three months that there was an actual improvement. So it's two different patients, one on the top and one at the bottom there, that, you um, and did show some significant changes at the corneal nerve level. And so there are some theories that, you know, perhaps PRP could help, you know, th that subset of patients that are always suffering, like that neuropathic and neurotropic pain type patients. So um, shifting gears to who can benefit from PRP then, right? So in my practice, you know, I, I really feel like mild, moderate, or severe dry eye patients can benefit from PRP. It could be aqueous deficient, it could be evaporative dry eye disease, LASIK-induced dry eye disease, and I find especially those LASIK post-refractive surgery patients uh, to find it hugely beneficial. Um, I've used it in neuropathic dry eye patients, and some of the research also indicates that it's helpful in those patients. We know it can help in the, uh, you know, corneal, um, sorry, uh, corneal uh, ulcer and recurrent corneal erosions. And uh, in fact, Jorge uh, Alio and his uh, colleagues have put out a lot of good papers that support that. And, you know, and I often sometimes um, use it in patients that have really kind of tried everything and, and, uh, and are patients that want just natural options. And they could be mild patients, but they perhaps don't want to be using uh, medications and, uh, and drugs. And so there's, there's kind of a really a wide use for where we can use PRP. Um, so this was a 40 year old patient that I saw that had LASIK about a year ago. And so she had been on um, Zydra and Restasis for about a year on and off and preservative free lubricating drops and doing a little bit of hygiene, lid hygiene, but just really frustrated with her vision. I mean, she got LASIK to get better vision and uh, and because of this dry eye that kind of came about more after of course her LASIK treatment you know was not able to see really well and so we started her on PRP and uh, you know in just almost six to eight weeks I mean it was it was really impressive how much her symptoms improved and her corneal surface improved and she was an interesting patient too because this is usually I layer a lot of uh, treatment approaches when I'm treating dry eye disease even with PRP uh, but this was you know, pretty much monotherapy and with at-home lid hygiene. And so she um, really came a long way with that. Now, this was another patient, um, you know, another subset of patients that I find a huge use for, uh, for PRPI drops is those Sjogren's patients, because this is an autoimmune disease that can really impact the corneal surface and kind of the conjunctival surface and the meibomian glands. I mean, it really hits hard and activates that vicious circle of dry eye disease from all angles. And so um, this is a subset of patients that I really find PRP drops make a really big difference in kind of correcting the damage that's, that's happening on their eye. Um, and so this patient also noticed uh, quite a significant improvement with, um, with her PRP eye drops. Now, this was perhaps one of my toughest patients that I saw, and this was a, you know, older, uh, older woman, um, Asian descent, and she was 80 year old and very fragile and just kind of really given up hope on any eye drop because everything burns. I mean, she was sensitive to everything on her skin, on her eyes, and she had tried several things. And besides doing all of that, this is what her eye looked like when I first saw her. 
Um, so I wanted to, you know, of course, start her on autologous serum and or autologous um, serum and or PRP eye drops. And so we talked to her about it. And at first, she was really not into it because, um, you know, she just couldn't believe that there would be something on the market that would not burn and sting her eyes. The only thing she could tolerate was refresh Indura at this point. And so, um, you know, after talking to her, we started her on uh, on PRP eye drops. And, you know, in this patient, uh, addressing the lid uh, condition was also really, really imperative. I know it's hard to see in this, but she did have significant blepharitis as well that hadn't been addressed. And I think perhaps with her age as well, it was very tough for her to kind of control that on her own. So we did some in-office treatments to kind of manage that. But doing all of that and with uh, PRP eye drops, I was really happy to see this is kind of what her eye looked like. Um, about three months um, after using PRP. And so this was the first time that she was, you know, her vision actually improved and she was comfortable um, kind of with her eyes a little bit. So it was really fascinating to see this. Um, so, you know, we've probably seen uh, this vicious circle of dry eye disease many times through this conference and listening uh, at other dry eye lectures, but I really wanted to highlight that PRP can also help with this, uh, you know, with this circle of dry eye disease. When we manage the entry points, right, when we treat the, uh, the blepharitis or the meibomian gland dysfunction, or we talk, about the talk to the patient about the preservative medications that they're on or the contact lenses that you're using, that they're using or control the environment that they're in. And, you know, perhaps suggest more blinking or less computer time or address their autoimmune diseases. And then we start to kind of layer treatments and put PRP in there. You know, we can really start to um, help treat the, the hyperosmolarity. We can prevent the cell death and damage due to those epitheliotropic factors in PRP. We can also help control the inflammation, um, you know, and reverse some of that uh, damage with PRP and prevent goblet cell loss. So really there's so many factors, you know, in this dry eye cycle that I see that, you know, is within those platelets and plasma to heal. Um, and this was again published in Ophthalmology Times earlier this year, and it said, and when clinicians do recommend blood deriv deriv derivatives, sorry, they're often implemented only as end stage therapy. And I think you and I can both agree that, you know, when we are listening to dry eye talks or, is, or when we're seeing patients in our practice, you know, we're not reaching uh, for for some of these natural products early on in our therapy. And perhaps it's a bias on our part or, um, you know, I'm not sure what it is, but when these patients could have really benefited from this use much, much earlier, because now this is a product uh, that doesn't have any, you know, any side effects that many of our drugs have. And so cost, yes, being a factor in these, but, you know, besides that, you know, I really think that it should be offered much, much too earlier to prevent getting so severe and to, you know, have that impact on quality of life. So back to my patient, right? We started off uh, with this poor lady with high eye pressures and on glaucoma drops and dry eyes. And so what are we going to do with this patient? So this was actually, you know, a really interesting case. And it's one of my favorite cases because it really highlights glaucoma management and dry eye management, something that us as optometrists can really um, kind of own because it's, it's an area where we can make a really big impact. And so I wanted to, you know, there was really nothing I was going to be able to do for this patient with that ocular surface disease burden that she was having from all of those glaucoma drops for a very mild glaucoma that she has. And so I wanted to get her off of those drops, you know, because I mean, when we're dumping all of that stuff on there, how can I make a change? How can I get this better? Um, and so it started with me calling some of the glaucoma, drop, uh, glaucoma docs in the area and just kind of expressing to them. What I really wanted to let them know was as this, hey, this dry eye disease, this ocular surface disease is really impacting my patients. And so when we're considering a glaucoma surgery in this patient, we want to get her off these drops. We want it to be minimally invasive because we know surgery can also be a huge burden on this patient's ocular surface. And so in talking to the glaucoma drops, I mean, I learned a lot and, uh, and, and it really helped them navigate, uh, you know, a treatment option for this patient because again, they're seeing this patient for a very small amount of time and without having that background knowledge that she's been to so many eye doctors and how much the ocular surface really impacts her life, 
I think that treatment results could have been or treatment options could have been different for this patient. So she went on to go ahead and get MIGS and I was able to then kind of manage her dry eye disease. Um, so she went up, went ahead and had the GAT procedure uh, for, uh, you know, which is a minimally invasive glaucoma procedure. And it got her pressures from 28 to mid teens on just one glaucoma drop and hoping we'd be able to get off of that because her pressures have been really, really stable. Um, and so that's a preservative free drop, much better than what she was on before. We started her on PRP eye drops four times a day and we addressed her lid disease at the same time. And um, you know she really improved and uh, kind of became a much happier camper. So in my clinic in Vancouver, Canada, we do make PRP eye drops uh, in, in our clinic. We use uh, stick, strict sterilization techniques and draw the blood. I have a person that comes in. Uh, she's a phlebologist that comes in and draws the blood for me. Uh, the appointments are about an hour long. Um, and then the patients kind of walk out with a three-month supply of PRP eye drops. And it's been really fascinating working with platelets you know, in the clinic because I can kind of see how the blood settles and how the platelets kind of settle in the blood. And it's, it's really been fascinating when you kind of look at all the different types of patients and um, the chronic diseases that they have and, and the impact of it on their blood. Just as a side note. So access to PRP and you know, how can your patients get this? You know, this has been a little bit challenging in, in, in the eye care world. I mean, we were seeing so much more of this PRP application in dentistry and in orthopedics and in dermatology, but in eye care, I think we are still a little bit behind. There are over 50, 40 different uh, kind of centrifuge systems and things like that available in medicine that we can use. We can also implement something in our own practice. Um, we might have to do a little bit of research on what the laws allow in, in particular states and provinces. You can also work with lo local labs. I'm hoping this information will kind of um, help um, some of those conversations and how we can get this uh, at our local labs. Um, and so in terms of instructions and how you write the prescription for PRP, so really the way I write it is one drop four times a day for three months. And I usually have my, all of my patients use them four times a day for three months. And I tell them that they need to refrigerate the drops in between use. And then the rest of the vials need to be frozen until they're ready to use. And so they're kind of given these detailed instructions on kind of how to handle these drops. Um, and it's, you know, I think we're going to see so many more applications of PRP, uh, of regenerative medis medicine in the future. I think there is more and more appetite for more um, natural options, things that don't have side effects and that, that are used for healing. So this is an application of PRP where it, it's actually platelet-rich fibrin, uh, where the platelets are um, highly centrifuged to kind of create this really rich platelet clot, which can then be kind of sewn onto the cornea and conjunctiva, uh, can be used under a biological membrane. It can be used as an amniotic graft to kind of really help uh, help with the healing. Now, PRP is also being injected into um, the lacrimal glands to see if they can be stimulated to um, in Sjogren's patients to help uh, treat that disease. So I, I know we're going to see so many more studies and results of this happening. Uh, PRP is also being injected into meibomian glands and seeing if there is any change in, in regeneration of meibomian glands as we know that so much of the dry eye disease today is meibomian gland dysfunction. So it's gonna be really exciting to see some of these uh, changes coming about. Now this, I don't know if this video will play, but we were kind of experimenting with PRF in our clinic. And so this is us centrifuging and then, um, you know, kind of taking, and that's, that's platelets. That's, uh, you know, probably like 30 times the concentration of uh, uh, platelets there. There we go. So it's so important. And that's it. <laughs> but just wanted to kind of show you the texture of that. Um, they're very strong. <laughs> and that's it. If you have any questions, please connect with me. I love, uh, I love connecting over social media or email. Uh, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions and, uh, and uh, treat dry eye disease together. Thank you. That was absolutely incredible to learn all of the ways that we can truly help our patients with their dry eye disease. There was a couple of questions in the chat from our from our audience where they were kind of curious of how do you do you know you have the start four times a day um, every day for three months. Is this something where patients are on for forever? Do you begin to taper off at some point? What does the long term treatment effects look like? 
That's a really, really great question. Um, so often, you know, in my practice, I'm seeing a lot of referred based dry eye patients. And so they are more moderately severe dry eye. And so what I find with them is that, is that I do use PRP four times a day for at least two rounds, which is six months. And then, uh, try to maintain with other things. And now some patients really love PRP because it doesn't burn and sting and they, and maybe cost is not an issue for them and they just wanna kind of stay on and don't wanna do other things. Uh, but for other patients, uh, you know, maintenance plan could look like I have them open up a vial and use it every other week. So they would use a vial four times a day for the first week, skip a week. So then a supply of three months would last them six months. And that's kind of the most biological products will last. I mean, um, past six months, um, they're just not active and uh, the half-life of molecules is, is just not there. But that's a that's a way um, that I manage some patients and, and others, you know, see enough results after, you know, two rounds or one round. And then they maintain with other things. And then I tell them that um, dry eye disease, you know, it's a chronic disease and it's going to have acute flare ups. And perhaps, you know, they may come back a year or two later and say, hey, I just, you know, it's, it's been a lot going on or I haven't been able to manage and, and, and can, can we use PRP again? And so that's another area where, you know, uh, you would use it just like you would use an amniotic membrane. You know, if you just kind of had a huge flare up and you saw a lot of dry eye, coming through and you said, okay, let's calm this down again. It could be a powerful tool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I learned a ton. Make sure that you stick around for our next session. It's going to be Keratoconus transforming the clinical obstacles into an opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Madan. And we are so yeah, excited to see care. you do more in the future. Thank you. Bye.